So I wanted to introduce very quickly Oracle for research and do this only once, so you don't have to have me between you and the formal dinner where we all sit down in a couple of days' time. Um, firstly, I would just like to thank Professor Ferguson for that talk. It was just fantastic and really uh, reminded me of what we were going through at Oracle with that during that time. So Oracle for Research in Europe, and we are very much Europe-focused, consists of three people, myself as a senior research advocate. Uh, my interests, I go back um, far too old now. Um, my interests originally are in environmental uh, research, polymorphic genes, um, and if I had, when I was at York University, if there had been an RSC organization at that time, I might still be in research. I might be sitting out there and somebody else standing here today. And uh, that wasn't to be. Um, I had the potential for a family and needed money and ended up working in soft software in industry. Um, and it is an absolute delight for Oracle for Research to support RSE. We see this as a really, really important thing for the future of software in science. In Europe, we have another research advocate, Mike Riley, who's just joined us from a PhD at Royal Holloway. Um, he's uh, really interested in developing CDT programs with, with PhD students. Please come and see him if you've got an interest in that space. And my old friend and mucker, Mike Riley, um, so Ryan's doing the, the CDT, Mike Riley is a solutions architect who, like the three of us, is here to help you with using Oracle Cloud to support research. And that is our terms of reference. I'm not going to read it out. But basically, we're here to provide grants um, in various forms to allow you to get started with Oracle Cloud. So we have a starter award. There's plenty of leaflets to show you about that. And especially um, for this event, um, we can avoid you going through the uh, anti-Bitcoin mining filter. You can sign up here to um, actually have a go with Oracle Cloud yourself. And then our bigger programs, where we work with our keynote speaker, for example, on research projects. And that's one of my delights here. What sort of interest? Oh, and there's Ryan's um, doctoral program initiative. So please uh, give him a, a, have a chat with him later if you can. It's going to be really interesting, I think. Our range of research, um, and also, for my delight, we are co-authors on a lot of papers where we're helping with the computing. So a great example here is with Sophia and Prof Mulholland with Christopher Woods, who's around, who will be able to tell you all about Oracle Cloud as well. Um, work on the Delta Spike was one of the most interesting projects I've ever had the honor to work on. But we go from hard science and hard uh, research in, in uh, grab waves, for example, through supporting citizen science programs to assist PhD students, and then into the um, digital humanities as well. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that we are now hosting uh, Slave Voyages, which documents the horrendous slave trade. So come and see us. Come and talk to us about your interests, and we'll see what we can do to help. That's enough of the, the marketing. It's now time to understand some really amazing science from Adrian, uh, from um, Dr. Vivian Raymond, who is exploring a really interesting area of gravitational waves. So please give a warm welcome to Vivian. Thank you.
Hi. Yes. So uh, thank you very much for uh, sticking here with me and, and listening to this. So I'm, I'm going to be talking about my research, gravitational waves, um, and how, I'll, towards the end, I'll talk a bit about how the, uh, how the cloud is actually very important uh, for, for our futures as a field and, and the type of products that we've done. But first, uh, let me uh, get started with, with gravitational waves. And, and in the movie here in, um, uh, on the screen, you can see a, a representation of, of two black holes merging. Those are the kind of events that we are interested in. So this is very, very far away, uh, a whole different kinds of, of, uh, of science from what we've been talking about. But this is about at the edge of what we know and understand in physics. And this is the type of, of observations and understanding that um, we desperately need to go to the next frontier of, of understanding of the, the fundamental properties of the universe. Um, we're kind of at the limit of what we can build on Earth. And so the universe being the ultimate laboratory, that's where we, we, we look at. Um, this is just a, a representation of what gravitational waves are really. And this is, if you see from the center of the pictures, two compact objects, in this case, uh, black holes, but it could be also neutron stars, very, very dense stars. When they orbit each other, when, when things that are dense enough moves, those waves in the very fabric of space and time are created. That means that when, when things that are heavy enough are moving fast enough, the very meaning of space and time changes as a function of time. And we can detect that, which wasn't a given uh, for a long time. The first time this happened was in 2015. And this is a illustration of what happened, actually. So this is a representation of a gravitational wave hitting the Earth. And this is genuinely what does happen when it does. Although, for the purpose of entertainment and visualization, um, <laughs> the scale is somewhat uh, exaggerated by, by <laughs> quite a bit. But the principle stands, right? This is, this is actually what, what, what happens. So uh, by scale being vastly exaggerated, I mean like a lot. So those waves, um, this is a, a numerical simulations of the creations of those waves. So here you will see in the bottom, the squiggly line is the wave itself as we are able to detect. So we measure it as a stretching and squeezing of, of, of space. The, the meaning of one kilometer changes as the wave passes by with those, those fluctuations. But to actually get that simple, simple line, um, months of supercomputers have to be used to actually solve the entire space-time structure around the two black holes. And this is what, what this looks like when we actually spend the time to make a movie for the, for the purpose of the talk. Um, so those are two black holes in the center. You see the, the dip in the middle um, below the two black holes. That, that's what we call them holes. Uh, black is just because they don't emit any light. And those holes are really where, where everything falls down and where you can't come out of. But everything else, the color scheme on the, on the plane that, that's rotating is the deformation of space-time. As they get closer and closer, they will start to move faster and faster. And at some point, uh, the uh, uh, orbit, as, as they move closer and closer and faster and faster, they lose a lot of energy through the emissions of those waves, which makes them go closer and closer. At the end here, and the movie is just artificially slowed down so we can see what happened, you see the deformation of space-time goes bonkers and crazy, completely non-linear, which is why we can't solve it any other way than, than uh, using numerical solutions on, on supercomputers. And at the end, you have this final black holes that just radiates all of its energy away, and is just now a stable configuration of space-time. So once that happened and once the, the wave is being sent, there is no other um, witness, there is no other way to tell that there is a black hole there, only the wave that was sent. However, that wave in particular, at the very end, um, this was a, a, a simulation of the first uh, um, detections that we made with this, with this instrument in 2015. This was about a uh, um, 29 solar mass black hole, so a black hole 29 the times uh, um, of mass 29 times the sun and uh, 35 solar mass black holes. But when they merge, the resulting black hole 
instead of being 64 solar mass, was only 62, a little less, 61 and, and a few. Three solar mass of black hole matter, whatever that is, and we don't really know. Uh, don't, don't believe when people tell you we, we don't. Uh, three solar mass of whatever that matter is just disappeared in energy directly. So if you remember E equals mc square, in the E equals mc square, the reason why this is such a big deal is c is a big number, the speed of light, square makes it a lot bigger, and three times the mass of the sun instantly converted into energy. This is the most energetic event we've ever witnessed, maybe for the, for the pedantics uh, uh, around there, um, uh, or experts, which tends to be a bit the same. Uh, the Big Bang is technically more, but that's because the Big Bang is just everything. So if you, if you put that you know, caveat aside, this was the most energetic event uh, ever in the universe. For at that moment, right when the two black holes merge and the, the merging black holes is born, the merged uh, black hole is born, uh, that event radiated more energy at that peak than the entire stars in the entire universe did. It's actually more than that. It's more than 50 times that. It's a, it's a totally extreme thing. But it turns out space and time are very stiff. They're very hard to deform. So it takes that amount of energy to deform them. And it takes that kind of detector to actually detect them. So this is um, uh, the LIGO laser interferometer gravitational observatory in Louisiana State. Uh, there are a few around the world, but this is one that's the prettiest because it has this nice forest in the back. Um, it's the um, it's middle in, of the swamp in Louisiana. There is a lot of um, alligators in the, in the uh, watersheds uh, uh, around. So it's, it's four kilometer long vacuum tubes inside of which lasers are bouncing back through interferometry trying to measure um, the stretching and squeezing of one arm versus the other. So this is a quick um, animation of what this looks like. A fairly basic interferometric, interferometric principle. The idea is we're using light as a ruler. So light being a wave, uh, we send that wave down one arm and with the beam splitter send it down the other arm, goes four kilometer, comes back, recombines. And depending on the difference in path lengths, if it recombines just right, there is no output. But if the distance of one arm is stretched compared to the other, say when a gravitational wave passes by, passes by then we get a little bit of light uh, at the end. And so that's how we measure. That allows us to actually measure things that are more similar to in distance to the wavelength of light that we're using itself as opposed to uh, using an actual, uh, an actual ruler. Now, of course, um, this is extremely simplified. Those machines are just incredible. Um, the wind that pushes on the walls is something that also makes those things uh, move. We have a lot of data that goes into analyzing and making sure that this is actually a deformation of space time and not someone that drove too fast on the parking lot. There are, you know, warning signs that says you have to draw. It's not so much a problem for the European and Japanese detectors because the cars are small. They don't really matter. But in the US, <laughs> Um, especially when the pickup truck breaks abruptly, that actually is a problem. And that's just to give you an idea of the, the engineering that goes in building this and making it work and all of the um, software engineering that goes in getting all of those witness channels is, is really uh, uh, fantastic and incredible. But I don't want to spend too much time on it or I won't have uh, time for the rest. But if you want to know about you know, why, for instance, the American Air Force doesn't fly above our observatories anymore is because we can detect things that they didn't like and so they stopped uh, because we're that sensitive. Um, so this is the gravitational observatories that are um, currently in the world. They are all, uh, most of them are kilometer scale, so either four or three kilometer long. Uh, and except for the GEO 600 detector, which is 600 meters long, which is more of a the worldwide prototyping facility. So this is where we test all of the new technologies before moving it to the, to the big machines. And um, the latest one will be uh, in India, um, a new detector. The site has been identified and things are starting to get built. And so this will uh, uh, add uh, another observatory to the, to the network. 
This is what they look like, and they are all pretty similar. Right? They are all this L-shaped uh, vacuum tubes. It's the same basic principles of interferomet interferometry. Uh, one of the differences is that the Japanese one, for instance, is underground, because while Japan is seismically active, seismic waves travel on the surface uh, of the Earth. So if you're, if you're underground, it's actually a lot quieter. But because they like to make it difficult, they also cool it at the uh, sub-Kelvin temperature with huge pumps, pumps that make a lot of vibrations. And uh, it's, a, it's yet another layer of, of complexity that we could, that we could talk about. Um, but this is the kind of, the, the measurements that we're talking about. So I, I showed this movie about the deformation of the Earth, and this was obviously exaggerated. This is a hydrogen atom, or at least it's a representation of a hydrogen atom. You see the proton in the middle and the electrons going around. Um, I'm sure everybody can right away figure out how, what kind of, of scale this represents, but my point is it's very, 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 very small, um, millions of times smaller than the width of a hair. But if we zoom in, if actually this does play, sorry. Well, this is embarrassing. <laughs> nope. All right, so that was it. Um, I apologize. Yes, if we zoom in, normally you would have seen <laughs> that what we are actually um, observing is something that is a thousandth the width of a, of a proton. So that little proton in the middle, the deformation of space-time, you imagine that little ball in the middle, the, the length that we're measuring is a thousand smaller than that. Which if you think about it is, is a bit crazy because we're using mirrors at the end of those things, right? The, the thing that the gravitational wave makes move that we then measure are mirrors, and mirrors are made out of atoms. So we're trying to measure something that is a thousand times smaller than the very component of matter that we use. At that scale, of course the mirror is not smooth. We're talking like orders of magnitude smaller than, than the atoms that make it, and, um, and yet it works. Uh, so we, there is a lot of reasons why it works and how it works. In particular, we actually average the surface of the mirror by um, shining a very powerful laser across a wide cross-sections of the mirror itself, which then makes the mirror heat because we're shining light on it, so we have to deform it just the other uh, way with a, a ring of heater on the other side, and because we're pushing with, it, with the laser, we have to push the exact way, the other way to compensate, and it goes on and on, but it actually does work. We've been able to detect uh, gravitational waves from, um, uh, uh, from binary black holes and binary neutron stars, uh, and we know we did because we have all of those different detectors, and they've all detected the same thing at the same time, the, that same uh, you know, vibrations, and we were able to confirm one of the final predictions of Einstein's general relativity. Uh, there are a lot of other sources of gravitational waves that we expect. So this is just a representation of a few of them. Um, uh, the first one on the left is a, a, just a single spinning neutron stars emitting those extremely powerful magnetic fields, which would uh, simulate gravitational waves. The, the next one is, is a, a neutron star being ripped to shreds and swallowed whole by a black hole. Um, and th those are, the, the middle one is a, a two you know, neutron stars merging, it's a, it's a simulation. Um, next to it is a supernovae exploding, so a star, the explosion of the stars, if it's not perfectly symmetric, will also emit uh, gravitational waves, the deformation of space and time we'll be able to discuss. And the, the last one is a representation of something a lot more speculative, um, cosmic strings, so it's possible that basically at the Big Bang, the way the universe was created, it wasn't perfect, it wasn't smooth, and there were a lot of cracks, and those cracks can emit gravitational waves. We haven't detected those yet, but that would be another way to learn about the fundamental uh, theory of physics. Um, I, I'm sure most of you have heard about the, the R2 pillars of modern physics. General relativity, which works very well for things that are very heavy, or move very fast, and quantum mechanics, which works very well for anything that's very small. And we rely on those theories for a lot of things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. The GPS system works thanks to general relativity. It wouldn't be accurate if we didn't have those corrections, and most modern computers do rely on quantum mechanics for their uh, very fine structure of, of, of processors. And so all of those things work together. It turns out 
Those two theories don't agree with each other. If you get something that's both heavy and or move fast and very small, we don't really know what happens. And one of the, well, one of the issues is, is we, we don't like it. <laughs> we don't know what happens. But also, which one is right? Or, as is the, the preferred solution, um, are they're probably both wrong at some level, so what is the actual theory of, what is the actual model of the universe we should use for our next leap forward in our in, um, the technological developments and our understanding of nature? We can't build things that are heavy enough to, to test those limits. Um, first, because it'd be a bad idea, because building a black hole on Earth is just a not a good, it would solve a lot of problem, but it's a bit of a, of a you know, it's, it's, it's a nuclear option in some sense. Um, and we, we can't make things at that level of, of energy, uh, even in, in the LHC, which look at, at, you know, extremely energetic things, it's not, it can't quite probe the areas where general relativity matters. So we can probe not really that, that limit that we're interested in. The universe does that for us though. So the idea, which in, you know, we, we want to know what's inside of a neutron stars, which is those, those, the ultimate form of matter. Anything denser collapses into a black hole. What happens right in the middle when you pack matters at densities that are totally unimaginable to do on Earth? This is where both general relativity and quantum mechanics will, will, will matter. So the idea is, well, let's just open it up, let's just rip a neutron star apart. And since we can't do it on Earth, we're just looking at things that happened in, um, uh, in the universe. And this is one of the things we finally were able to do, or rather, our detectors got sensitive enough that we were able to observe neutron stars being ripped to shreds by black holes, and we are doing the, the fine analysis to see if our predictions are right and what actually happens. What is that, that collection of matter that gets, you know, unveiled by gravitational waves, what, what will that lead us, uh, lead us to conclude? Uh, but this is something that, from a, from a software engineering point of view, is quite complicated. And um, I'll, I'll, I think in front of this audience, I can say it, we do not have enough resource software engineers in our field as we should, uh, given the amount of code that we, that we write and that we have. Um, but my point of this is to, to tell you that gravitational wave astronomy has a lot of different time scales that we, that we are interested in, that we care about. Uh, in, in matter of seconds, we have all of those environmental sensors that are around the detectors that tell us whether someone was driving around the parking lot or not, and whether we should, the, the gravitational observations, whether we should care about it or not. Uh, we then generate triggers, we try to figure out where in the sky it comes from, we do all of the data qualities and parameter estimation. The point is we have all of those different um, time scales of computing that matters. We do high performance computing to build those numerical activity models of those, of those waveforms, but we also need high throughput computing with very, very low latency. And the reason for that is best uh, illustrated by this uh, this simulation. So this was a simulation of two neutron stars moving. This is very similar to the to the black hole uh, simulation that I that I showed before, except that this time, well, first it ought to be a little smoother. I guess this is a little too much for the for the uh, computer here. But the point is, instead of having just two black holes that merge, you have these swirls of matter um, going around, and these swirls of matter will eventually collapse and form a black holes. But while it does that, this is one of the few gravitational events that while it does that, it would also emit light, a lot of it, which we'll be able to, to see by um, uh, you know, telescopes, or the way we like to think old-fashioned astronomy, uh, because you know, we're the, the new, the cool kids on the block. And this is, this is the, the localization that happened uh, in, um, uh, uh, in real time in, in August 2017. So first, uh, the Fermi gamma ray telescopes in orbit detected something over there. With the help of another one, they were another gamma ray telescope integral, they were able to narrow it down to that, to that area in the sky. And we detected gravitational waves coming from that patch in the sky. And that has to happen very, very quickly. We're talking seconds, otherwise we're gonna miss it. Using all of the detectors in the network, we were able to narrow down to that area in the sky, and then all of those circles are 
galaxies that were identified uh, in galaxy catalogs before then, one of them, by taking a lot of pictures, one of them, uh, this one in particular, a little dot appeared uh, in, in, the, uh, in the visible light just right where we predicted it would be, which was tremendously ex exciting. Um, this is something that had to happen very quickly because that light fades very quickly, especially the high energy component of it fades the quicker, and that's the one that has potentially the most information. So if you wait 10 minutes, you might totally, first you might miss it entirely because you can't figure out which of those galaxies actually come from, but even then you won't get the actual uh, important data. When this was made uh, available and we, we sent that information to all of our astronomer friends, every telescope in the world was taking picture of that galaxy. It's, it's one of those things that this is the patch of the sky that has had the most picture taken. I mean, it looks like just any other galaxies and yet this one, everybody looked at it. We even were somewhat worried that um, uh, we might make a mistake and so we wanted to cross check before things got public, but we still sent all of the information right away to all of the uh, um, telescopes out there. And um, I guess this shows how, how focused on our work we were. Uh, it turns out Hubble, the, the NASA Space Telescope, has a Twitter feed that tells everybody what it's looking at. And so all of our effort of secrecy uh, was actually <laughs> blasted on Twitter. It, I mean, it didn't really matter. Our point was we, we didn't want people to have false um, you know, excitements if it wasn't true. It turned out to be absolutely right. We did a lot of analysis of this. And in particular, we found out through this analysis that we found the source of most of the heavy elements in the universe. So all of the light-ish elements in the periodic table, uh, hydrogen and helium were formed at the Big Bang at the, at the very beginning. But everything in blue, which we are most uh, made out of, that comes from, from stars uh, exploding, supernovae and novae exploding. So we are all made out of the dusts of, of, of stars. Uh, but heavier elements, you know, like gold and platinum and, and the ones that are really important uh, for, for some reason. Actually, those were made by merging neutron stars just like the one that we've seen. So this, is, um, um, this was quite a, 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 quite a realization. Uh, while we're made from exploding stars, all of the heavy elements at some point were made by smashing, neutron stars smashing together. And this, this led to, you know, people thinking of, of can, we, can we do a grant proposal to try to tell people we're gonna find, you know, piles of platinum and gold. It doesn't quite work like that uh, because they've, this happened a lot in the past because we are looking at it far away. But still, the point is, um, this is the source of most, if not all, of the, of the heavy elements, um, which was, was interesting in its own right. Uh, now, a quick update since then, this is the, our rate of observations. So we started uh, our first observing run in 2015 when we saw you know, one detections and then another one and then another one. And as the detectors get better and better, we are observing more and more. In particular, we have one advantage. Unlike um, with light, when we're sensitive to the square of the intensity, the gravitational wave detectors don't absorb light, right? The, the gravitational wave passes, moves the mirror, but continues through. It's actually very little affected by matter, which makes it hard to detect, but also means that we can use it to look very deep inside phenomenons, because when the neutron star smashes and they emit gravitational waves, those gravitational waves can go through all of the dust that has been, all of the gas and, and plasma that's around without being impeded, so we can really go at the core of what's happening and, and, and hope to unlock those, those uh, pieces of fundamental physics. Um, but that means that since we're sensitive directly to the amplitude of the waves, since we don't observe it, every time we make the detectors twice as good, we can see things twice as far, and that means we have eight times more volume to play with. So any little improvement in our detectors makes that, that ramp up in the rate of, of detection. Um, one of the, the things that we, we worked at with uh, our, our colleagues and is, is, you know, in terms of uh, uh, processing all of these data, have those, those pipelines that are reviewed, that are under version control, that work, but we also had teams in place to look that everything uh, works well. Um, we had teams that were 
sent on scheduled of one month at a time uh, at the start when I was in charge of that particular part of, of the group. We had, you know, two people in two different time zones for one month will look at the data for a while. And for the 01 and 02 observing run, that worked pretty well, except at the very end of the green space in August, where suddenly we detected many, many, many things and the team that was in charge there threatened to quit because it was just relentless. I mean, it was fantastic. This was a, a summer, for us, this was a summer to remember, uh, but we don't do it that way anymore. And in particular, one of the things that we're moving towards, uh, we need a lot more automation, a lot more reliability of the software, which is not something that people with a you know, theoretical astrophysics degree are very good at. And so this is one of the ways we're trying to change the way we, we, we work and have things that, um, are as reliable, the robustness is critical. We can't, we can't miss one of those and it can't fail and it, it can't have a human pick it up. This is something that has to run now. And that, that's a, from a software engineering point of view for us, that's a big step change in the way we, we, we were doing things before, right? Before we, we spent years waiting for this one detections and now we have several uh, uh, ones happening uh, every day, and so we, we have to totally change the way we, we, we program. Uh, this is our, our observations uh, so far. So every, uh, as a function of, of solar masses, every dot is, every blue dot is a black hole, every uh, orange dot is a neutron star, and the arrow represents when they merge. So for us, every detection we make, we get to add three dots on that, on that diagram because there is you know, the two objects that were there first and then the one that they left at the end. Um, and one point I want to bring up is this was what we knew about compact objects, neutron stars and black holes before the advent of gravitational waves, all of the ones that were seen by um, traditional telescopes. So you, you can't see a black hole. It's black, but um, you can see the effect it has on things around it, and that's how they were detected before, right? A black hole around the star, you can see the star that orbits nothing, and then that tells you there is something there, and you can estimate its mass and see how much light it emits, and then you, we can tell whether it's a black hole or not. But if you can see what the, what the statistical analysis tells you, we thought that black holes were at most between five and 10 times the mass of the sun. We thought that th this invisible universe out there in our galaxies and beyond, that's what the universe was made of. All of this you know, invisible matter where black holes are roughly that size. It turns out there is a lot more that are a lot heavier. And that was a bit of a surprise for um, how stars are born and, and uh, uh, some of the fundamental building blocks of galaxies and how our universe actually evolves. There is a lot of very, very heavy things um, which could only be detected with gravitational waves. This is a, this is a brand new tool to study the universe. And um, this was one of the many surprises that, uh, that we've been able to see. Um, a couple of notes on, on the cloud in particular. So this is something that uh, I've been uh, lucky to have access to, to Oracle Cloud for this, uh, uh, for this type of, of analysis. And a lot of our computing is still done in-house on, on you know, computer clusters that are managed by the universities. But we need, uh, because we're an observationally driven science, our computing is very burst in, in usage patterns. Suddenly we detect something and then we need to get a lot of computing power, especially in high throughput computing, to actually filter the data, do the analysis, and get that map of the sky to be sent to uh, telescope partners in seconds. And that requires uh, the capacity to ramp up, which makes sense uh, to use the, the cloud for. But we also have very different needs. So, there are some of our algorithms and, and detection strategies that are clearly high throughput computings meant and, and cannot easily be parallelizable, um, while others really, really can and might take you know, months of running on uh, thousands of cores uh, at a time. And we have this, this spread of needs, but we don't necessarily have the capacity to buy the things that we need all the time. So, 
having that flexibility of being able to use different architectures, different hardwares, we might need at some point very high memory nodes or a lot of GPU nodes, but that's very hard to predict. The time scales to purchase things in academia is not the fastest, and sometimes it doesn't make sense, right? Sometimes I want to test whether my code is going to be efficient on that new you know, architecture that just come out. I don't want to buy it before I know if it works or not, but I really need to spend time running on it to check all the benchmarks. In particular, this, I think this highlights the need for research software engineers embedded in the research groups that are able to do that type of, of analysis and testing and can go back and says, yes, that algorithm will work there, but it won't work here, so we can then focus on using that type of, um, uh, uh, of hardware. There is also our, you know, the interest in having the latest and greatest in terms of confidential hardware. I mean, the, you know, things get better very, very quickly. Um, and usually when we buy it, in, again, in academia, we have to stick with it for a while. While using the cloud, it's kind of fun to be able to move a couple of sliders, and then you have access to the latest one, which you may or may not justify for your, uh, for your code. So um, those are two different, the bottom uh, bullet points are two different um, examples that we've managed to use cloud computing for. So we were able to run those, some of those numerical simulations that you saw the, the big movies of were run in the cloud with this cluster in the cloud uh, concept. So it's, it looks like a traditional computer clusters where it's actually running in a lot of different places. Um, and that shown very good scalability. Uh, it, it will produce almost, not quite, but almost the performance of a standard dedicated uh, in-house in -house cluster. Uh, the, the latest one that we're working on is this astrophysical uh, interpretations. So we are, once we get the data, we're trying to analyze and estimate a lot of uh, parameters of the, the models, which are complicated. That requires a lot of computing, but this is also the kind of things that requires a lot of computing right now and next week, not really anymore. So this is the kind of thing that we are very eager to move into the cloud, and this is the, the kind of, of results that we've obtained so far. So this, this is just a, a plot to show that we have a lot of parameters to estimate, which is what makes it all, all, all complicated, and why we are interested in um, various architectures to support different sampling algorithms that work better on you know, different architectures. Um, and I'll, I'll finish this, otherwise I'll finish there. I mean, I have a million more slides and I could talk for hours about this, uh, but I can see from the clock that uh, coffee break is, is soon and I wouldn't want to be the one that stands between you and coffee. Um, but to finish, so this is a brand new, this is just an artistic illustration of a neutron stars about to be swallowed by a black holes, which again, it's, it's some of the most, it is the most energetic class of events in the universe. This is at the edge of what we understand physics to be, and it requires the most accurate, the highest precision length measurement ever made to actually, to actually measure. So it's a, it's a very cool field to, to, to work in. And yeah, we, we are hoping to move to the next, uh, next frontier of physics with that kind of, that kind of observation. Thank you. Is it true that when two black holes collide, there's so much energy and matter produced that we've seen today that you get between 30 and 300 tons of diamond produced? And if that is the case, how do we get our hands on it? So diamonds is, is actually kind of light, right? It's just carbon that has been uh, squished a lot. So in... That's just too light for black holes. If you, if you want a giant pile of diamonds, you want to look inside of the core of Jupiter and Saturn, which has the advantage to be a lot closer. The, the core is, the pressure is high enough to make diamond, and uh, you know, there is, we know there is a lot of carbon there, so chances are the core of those objects are moon-sized diamond blocks, um, which, you know, here is an idea to fund a uh, space exploration. But uh, for, for around black holes and neutron stars, this is where gold and platinum would be, would be created. 
which is also uh, very interesting. However, those are quite a bit further away. And while going there is impossible, uh, coming back is maybe even more so. So um, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess we could try. Uh, I'd be willing to try, but uh, I'm not sure that's, that's realistic. We won't go for that uh, top question. Same one, uh, how much total Oracle computing power did you use during the simulations? Oh, that's a very good question. I actually don't remember on top of my head. Uh, it was about a thousand cores for a couple of weeks. Um, but I, that, that's the only number is that, I, that I know on, on, on top of my head. I mean, that's, it was uh, in one of the new data centers which, uh, Hirschburn, which, you know, we, we, we got to play with. I mean, it's like being handed the, the key to a brand new car and just go, yeah, let's, let's go to town. So we were, it was, it was very fun. That, that's about the scale, I remember. Um, one more then, uh, there's one, another one with seven there. So is the lack of- I think the there is a hand up all oh, the way at the top. Oh, no. Who can- <laughs> Thanks, Barry. <laughs> I have a very quick question. Um, there's a theory that low mass black holes might account for, you know, dark matter. Will you be able to ever test that? Yes, and that's a that's a very good point. So this was one of the we we think there is a lot of matter that doesn't emit light. We also think there is a lot of black holes out there that doesn't emit light. So is is one equal one? It doesn't quite work. So the problem with that. It, this, is, this is the exact questions that one of the questions we were able to test. So to have enough of those light black holes to explain the motions of, of stars that makes us think there is dark matter, we would need so many that we would have seen a lot more gravitational waves from them. So the numbers don't quite work. The, the, we were just able to put up a limit. So we know that black holes cannot make 100% of dark matter. They might make a fraction of it, but they can't, they can't make, there is something else, uh, which is either another particle or we don't really understand how gravity works on, on large time scales. But yeah, that, that is one of the exciting things that we were able to test. Okay, maybe I pick up from here. Thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering, as the rate of observations uh, increases, and you argued that the flexibility of the cloud is very important, Will you move to dedicated hardware as soon as like, the need is so frequent that it's reasonable? Sorry, will you move? So, so, so the, the rate of the observations increases, so at some point the, the burst of computing powers is not that necessary, but it, it's, stead it's steady instead. Will you then move to dedicated hardware? Yes and no. So the, the problem with that is um, uh, the rate is governed by Poisson statistics. And so as it, as it increases, it's true that you can, you can measure, you have a, a steady rate that is pretty accurate, but because of the way it works, even with the, when the rates increase, you still have periods where things are a lot, lot higher and periods where things are a lot lower. No, that, that phenomenon is scale invariant in some sense, right? You, the periods where there is not a lot might be still more event than you had before. There will still be minutes, hours, and days where you have a lot more events than the day before, right? So that, that features will still, will still be there. Uh, part of the problem of very, very low latency is that it's unlikely we'll be able to do everything on the, on the cloud, right? There will have to be there is right now, and there will have to be some dedicated hours that are at the site to do the, the very first filtering and converting. But at some point, we need to get the data from all of the detectors somewhere to do an analysis that includes all of them. That's the one that can do the scale localization very quickly. And this is the kind of thing where, you know, on, on a regular basis, you might have to get a few maps ready, but there could be this one hour where suddenly you get you know, hundreds more and we need all of those maps. On top of that, it's very hard at that point to predict which one is gonna be very important. 
And by important, I don't necessarily mean louder, right? We're looking for the extreme ones, the, the most massive one, or the one that rotates the fastest or to, to push our limits. And we, we live in the fear of missing one that will turn out to be the critical piece that we needed to actually solve the, the theory questions. Uh, thank you, everyone. Unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions. There's loads of really great ones. Are you staying with us for the rest of the, the day, Vivian? Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah, be around. Great. So try and patch your room in the break, maybe. Um, okay, so with that, we'll close this session and go into a break. Thank you very much.